Welcome to the Speaking Up Influence podcast with virtual business speaker, presentation skills and influence coach, John Ball. Remember to like and subscribe. The Speaking of Influence podcast is uploaded and distributed using Buzzsprout. Buzzsprout makes it really easy to get your podcast started and out to a wide audience with lots of tips and useful tools to help you on your way. If you're interested, check the link in the show notes and start your podcast today. Welcome back. I'm really happy to have with me my guest today because we're going to be talking about an area that I find incredibly fascinating. I certainly hope you will as well. I think it is. And I don't think we could really get a better expert in the area of scientific learning. This is her area of expertise. She is known as the learning pirate. So we'll have to be asking more about that. <laughs> her name is Lauren Morgan. Welcome to the show, Lauren. Such a pleasure, John. <laughs> it's really great to have you on. And uh, we, when we had our pre-call chat, I felt that could have been the podcast episode of <laughs> itself. It was <laughs> so interesting talking to you. And, and I think one of the things that, that was so interesting for me was just getting into understanding how people learn best and that we don't mm. generally take very much time out of our lives to stop and think about how we learn as much as we might think about what we learn. And, and so I know that this is going to be a good call today. One thing I have to stop asking you though is why the learning pirate? What's the significance of the pirate for you? So I feel like that's like the most asked question. Like it, it's, you know, um, the pirate comes in a variety of forms. I'm convinced at this point in my life that I was probably a pirate in a past life. Um, it was just kind of part of the that little child in me that loved adventure and curiosity. And, you know, I think that has a lot to do with learning. It's when you're chasing your curiosity, it's because you're excited to learn or to know something. And uh, so that's kind of where the pirate originated from. And then I think, you know, when I started learning pirate, it became more of a, a symbol of changing the way things were done a little more aggressively, <laughs> you know, um, plus it's, you know, now, now I'm just known as the pirate. I don't think anyone knows my real name anymore. So. <laughs> <laughs> but that, that's all great fun as well. And it's, so it's a nice playful name for what you do and uh, maybe doesn't uh, get uh, straight away that, about the seriousness behind it, but that's good because mm -hmm. we want people to come to this with, uh, to come to learning with a sense of playfulness and fun about it because we learn better when we're having fun, right? Yeah, and I think it's that, it's that sense of curiosity. You know, if you, when you're watching children as they're learning and as they're, they're exploring their worlds for the very first time, that just inherent curiosity is something that you know we tend to lose a little bit as as we get older. And for me, I just I, I guess I just never did. Um, I'm you know I see something over there. I'm like, ooh, what is that? <laughs> so um, that's also where the pirates came in from is giving right. us that sort of you know permission to have fun because learning should be fun. You know we'd like it to be fun, but not taking away from the fact that learning is incredibly challenging and it's hard. Uh, but you know we can we can chase our curiosities and enjoy that part of the adventure. Who's who's your favorite pirate, real or fictional? Oh man! Um, so I, oddly enough, there was five female pirates back in the day, and I'm going to forget the name of the of the one who uh, there was Grace O'Malley, uh, and she was she was one. But there was this one um, in from China. And she had, at one point, I think, the largest fleet and the largest crew of any pirate. And so I was just like, oh, wow, that's, I, I respect that. Because back in those times, right, yeah. <laughs> that would have been unheard of. So um, I'd have to look up, uh, up the name, but she was phenomenal. So although she pillaged yeah. and did all the bad things. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> you've, done, you've, done, you've done a bit of homework on pirating, that's for sure. I did. <laughs> when, when it comes to learning, you had a bit, of a, a bit of a journey yourself, a bit of an adventure for getting into this whole area in the first place, which, which I found fascinating and a, and a real sense of your level of commitment to what you do. So perhaps mm -hmm. you could share a bit of that journey to, your, uh, to what you're doing now and to sure. what that actually took for you to get there. So I think like most people, I went through a very standardized educational process, elementary, high school, university, college, um, and there was nothing spectacular about it. Um, I can honestly say I'm not sure that I remember much of anything from, from those years. 
But um, when I got into learning and development and I started designing and um, instructing, I was facilitating, I was training trainers and teachers, there was always this very instinctual feeling that something was missing. And as my career progressed, um, I got the opportunity to meet some phenomenal people and one of them introduced me to the neurosciences. And it was that missing piece for me. It was that this is what I think I intuitively knew, but, but didn't know that I knew it. But it was the learning process then of, well, if we wanna understand what learning is or the process of learning, well, the place that it happens is in the brain. So I went back and uh, started studying the brain. And for me, I was about 35 at the time and I could not get my head around it. It was so challenging. I never had a scientific background. Um, I didn't do exceptionally well in math in school. And all of a sudden, here I am with no previous experience learning some of the most challenging things that I had, I'd ever learned as an adult. And I think, you know, in our previous discussions, I had told you that it was going back and looking at things like a child, learning how to pronounce words again, um, getting very frustrated and upset because I couldn't grasp things. But at the same time, I became my best learning experience and experiment, which is I had to put myself through a very true process of what learning was. And it was excruciating and it was frustrating, but it was also incredibly victorious at the end. Mm. So was it more a sense of uh, preaching what you practice than practice what you preach? Oh yeah, oh yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but had I not had that experience, um, I wouldn't have been able to, to sort of really understand from a designer's perspective as well, how do I make that process easier for the people who I'll be designing for? Mm. So it really, it helped me with my own learning. It, um, you know, and I think mostly as well what it helped me with, because when you deep dive into the brain, you're learning about yourself as a fundamental human. And that changes everything. The more that you understand your operating system and how we process and whatnot, it really does change um, the whole game about how we look at not only learning, but yeah. as ourselves. I've read a number of books about, about the ways of learning, methodologies for learning, and uh, how best to work with comprehension. And, and mm. definitely there's some stuff out there that is a bit out there. <laughs> and there's some stuff out there that, that's pretty solid and, and does seem to work. Um, what kind of stuff have you encountered that that just is rubbish and should be avoided or sort of like brain myths if you like about learning mm -hmm. and, and what what's the kind of stuff that we should be paying more attention to so i mean as far as brain myths goes i think this has been the year of uh i think just nailing the final you know or putting the final nail in the coffin of learning styles i think we've heard uh we've heard that across the board um it's already been empirically proven by science that learning styles aren't really a thing the brain doesn't just learn with one particular section it learns with it with its entirety um, so that's definitely one of the, the larger ones. I think that um, for retention of learning, again, I think it goes back to what most of us probably would have experienced when we were going through school is we would sit there and we would cram and we would do rote memorization. Um, I, grew, I grew up in Toronto, Canada, and to this day, I can remember sitting in French class and just right you know, after the professor would say something, just repeating it back over and over and over again. And it just wasn't the way to, to learn and to encode. So those types of methodologies, they do have their, their place, like, you know, rote memorization has its place, but this sort of looking at our brains and looking at learning as just get it all in there as fast as you can, right. uh, it just, it doesn't feel good. We don't remember anything. Um, so it's essentially ineffective learning. So, uh, you know, things like that, but on the flip side of it, you have phenomenal, uh, methodologies and theories that come directly from research and science and experimentation. Um, it's just unfortunate because they're not out there as, as you know, widely used as I'm sure the scientists would love to see them. Yeah. I think one for myself and, and possibly for, for people who are going to be listening to this as well, and uh, that may be in the world of online course creation, mm. understanding some of these things is going to be critical because yeah. a lot, a lot of, things moving that way like online education is 
is big business right now mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and you know lots of people are saying well you know this is going to be the future of education and, and and i would say you know for me i i've learned far more in my online education than i did from academia yeah. uh, at my time at university although that was a great experience in, as in terms of learning my own self-directed learning has been much more valuable to me since then than, mm -hmm. than it was at that particular time. But I think a lot of course creators are really going to want to try and get a sense from you about what sort of things they should be doing to make sure that they're creating content mm -hmm. and course materials in a way that's going to be understandable, learnable, memorable, and, mm -hmm. and work best with the students. I think that that's, you know, that's the first place that I would start in, as far as course creation goes is, is to, for me, knowing about the brain and its limitations and its resources, it's as a designer, we want to protect that. We want to sort of, we want to utilize it effectively and efficiently, but we want to protect the resources as well. So to that point, I'd say for me, when I'm designing something, I'm really taking into consideration the cognitive load. And the cognitive load is really how much can the brain take in in its working memory at any one given time without getting completely exhausted and shutting down. Mm -hmm. So a really great example for those who are course creating, especially in the online world right now, if you can imagine your brain as uh, almost like your house, right? And there's different places in your house and the, each place has a certain function. So you've got your kitchen is where you do your cooking. Well, in my brain, let's say it's a, a part, a small part that that does all of my emotional processing. That, that's one part. My visual centers that are going to process everything that I see as far as what's on my screen and the pixelations on the screen. Um, you know, I've got my length. I've got all of these little different places in my brain that do everything essentially. But when I'm designing, and what I'm going to recommend for designers is that you've got to sort of say, if I'm using too much energy, if I'm using too many of those resources then you're going to get tired a lot faster. So if you're an online learning designer and you're like, oh, this is so cool. I want to put this music in the background and this really great color. I've got this text font that I want to use. Oh, and that video, right, that video. You're already using so much energy and so many of those resources, mm. which means the cognitive load is going to, you know, it's going to exceed its limit before someone probably gets 15 minutes in. So my, my first recommendation would be Again, not everyone's going to go out and learn everything that there is to know about the brain. That's why you've got people like me. <laughs> but if you just kind of take those little things and look at your screen and go, hmm, maybe I need to just kind of power down a bit. Maybe I can like take some of those texts out and I don't have to narrate here or and really start being intentional about what is on that screen. You're mm -hmm. going to help your learner to be able to give their attention to the thing that you need them to focus on. When it comes to delivering information, and one of the things that I've often heard time and time again in public speaking clubs, for example, is mm -hmm. about creating content as if you were directing it to um, children of eight to 12 years old. And I sometimes get concerned that that might be for some people oversimplifying. Like we say, um, you're talking about some level of simplification, but it's simpl simplifying the right things. And sometimes I think taking things down to a level that some some adults may find a bit condescending or a bit too. Right. Um, do you think it's important to find some sort of level of balance in there about the level of information that you're giving? Absolutely. Um, there is a professor out of UCLA. His name is Robert Bjork, and I, I admire his work so much. Um, and I, I'd encourage people to, to look up some of his stuff because he's been in this for you know, decades. Um, but he has a theory of desirable difficulties. And desirable difficulties mean that we want to insert challenge. We, want to, we do want to insert things that are, that are difficult because when we make it too easy, then the brain just goes, oh, I know this, we're good. And I'm like, okay, we'll just move on. I'll just go shop on Amazon while you play in the background. <laughs> so so you, you want a level of difficulty and it's almost, you know, that the brain's natural, um, natural place is to go, I'm comfortable, I'm safe, I'm good, I'm good right here. We want to push it out of that comfort zone to be, I'm not so sure about this. This is kind of confusing me, but let's keep going. So it is, it is quite a balance of, of those two things. In saying that, though, 
for for those um, of your of your audience who are in e-learning and in the design is learning does not happen immediately. Yeah. And it certainly doesn't happen after a one hour module of something. Uh, the encoding process of memory is very intricate and it takes a lot more time than we actually realize. So, mm. um, you know, we have high hopes and high expectations of how people can learn and how fast they can learn. But in actuality, the human process of it is not that fast. Right. So this is an area that I find particularly fascinating. And I, I like to read a lot. I like to listen to audio books, especially because I find I can get through a lot more learning and information and but even then sometimes I get to a point where I was like I need to put something aside for a while or go and listen to a bit of fiction or just put some music on and give my brain a rest you know like, mm -hmm. like too much weights in the gym but there was a, a, certainly a time when I was uh, listening to like Blinkist and, and getting all these like blinks of uh, key points or nutshell books and listening to other book reviews and and just getting tons and tons of information as well as running alongside doing several online courses at the same yeah. time uh, and you just get to the point where thinking how much can you really take in and, and is this really learning uh, if you're if you're reading blinkist or listening to blinks or uh going through an audiobook summary of something really that's all you're getting in my opinion is familiarization right you're not really right. learning because if you were asked to recall that, you're probably going to have to refer back to the materials. You don't exactly. kind of own that knowledge. Exactly. How, how do you get to a point of, um, of getting that knowledge solidified and having it for yourself to be able to draw on as part of your own knowledge bank? I really, so first you have to define whether, you know, what is your goal here? Do you want to learn, which is more long-term encoding of memory, or do you want to perform? And performance is short-term and you can, you, you know, you can, you can Google that, you, you know, Google something or YouTube, you know, watch the YouTube video again or revisit the book. Um, so first establish which one is more important. Is it, you just want to perform something or do you actually want to learn for the long-term? If you want to learn for the long-term, it's really a matter of, you know, strategizing how you're going to space out your learning when you're going to do it. Um, I can give you an example of an experiment I'm actually conducting on myself right now. <laughs> yeah. um, I decided, uh, you know, I, as, as someone who, you know, can learn a, a skill, I've been able to, you know, learn obviously everything I've learned about the brain through, through my studying, but I had never challenged myself to learn anything with my motor skills. So I said, I'm gonna teach myself how to juggle. <laughs> and it's very, very difficult. But knowing what I know about how the brain is gonna encode and how it's gonna form the pathway, I said, all right, where are the steps I'm gonna take? Well, first I'm gonna watch a YouTube video, why not? Let's get some basics here. So I'm just gonna take in that little bit of information. But I also know that I have to create pathways in my brain to be able to do the motions. But I'm not going to try to grab three balls right away and just, you know, go for it. So it was that progressive buildup of I'm going to start with one ball and I'm going to get that feeling down. I'm going to get this and let my brain understand what that feeling is, because most of us aren't used. Um, most of us, I don't think, are omnidextrous, which means you know, we're not really good at using both of our hands. So that was the first step. Second step. OK, I do that for a couple of days. I take a break. Now, I don't practice every day. That's my key. I want to do spaced repetition so that my brain has time to just relax. And then it, I challenge it with those desirable difficulties to retrieve what I've already learned and then start integrating in more and more and more. So I'm consistently practicing, but I'm not cram practicing mm. until I can finally, and I'm not there yet, by the way, <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not there yet. I've hit myself in the head, you know, so many times, <laughs> um, but I'm not there yet, but it's really, being intentional about that. Um, memories are encoded while we sleep as well. Yeah. So it's really important to allow for that process to happen, to get your rest and to let, you know, while we sleep is the only time the brain is remembering and forgetting things at the same time. It's actually really cool. Um, so to give yourself that time to rest and to sleep so those memories can start getting a little bit more solidified and then go back and make them stronger and stronger and stronger mm -hmm. through practice and, and repetition. Yeah, I, oh. I just recently listened to, I think it's Matthew Walker, his mm -hmm. book on um, why we sleep. 
uh, mm. campus. But that was that was fascinating, and 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 was talking about memory encoding and mm -hmm. things like that, and and the effects that uh, even just like mild alcohol use can have on, oh, yeah. uh, on memory yeah. encoding, and uh, and how how much harder it is to remember things. Um, so yeah, sleep sleep uh, is a critical part of all this process as well. Definitely. In Definitely. terms of in terms of ingraining information on a maybe a more studious sort of level, like for example, like I, one of the areas that I am particularly interested in is uh, influence and, and persuasion skills. Mm -hmm. So if I'm looking, wanting to read books and really master them and know them and and be able to recall them and and cite them, uh, and I'm going to use the spaced repetition as part of my process for doing that what what are the best ways to approach that and to, and to get the the best results there definitely zero in on your content i think when people think about wanting to remember something they start incredibly broad and large right like i need to remember that whole chapter i need to remember this whole book if i want to cite it correctly but like i said take take care of your own resource right and how much you really want to put in there and what are those really important points that that you want and then why is it important for you to want to know this, right? We do, as far as we know thus far, have unlimited capacity um, to, to remember. Our memories are unlimited as far as we know at this moment. So it's, you can actually remember the whole book or, <laughs> or whatever, but zero in on what's really important and what you want to focus on because then you're saving your cognitive load. You're saving your working memory. That's number one. Um, there are mixed reviews on highlighting and taking notes. Um, note taking is 100% uh, effective, but there's different ways that you can go about it so that you can encode in a different way. So if I'm, for, for example, um, I read a lot of white papers and a lot of scientific uh, journals. And if I, if there is something like you that I really want to remember, then I've got my notes, but on one side, I'm just going to take a quick, like, you know, written note, but on the other side, I'm encoding with pictures. I'm triggering my brain to remember in a different way, in a different space and, and place. I'll leave it for a day or two, and then I'll come back and revisit it. However, before I revisit it, I'm not going to look directly at the sheet. I'm going to try to retrieve what I can before I go and look and just start to memorize again. So it's, again, it's not only part of the, the process of saying, what do I know, which is metacognition, but it's also, if you already know something, then I can move on from that. And if not, then I can just reinforce it by going back and reviewing and practicing again. Mm. But always challenge, I think that's the thing is we always wanna take the easy route because that's, the, that's what we've known our whole time, you know, growing up with cue cards, like look front, back, front, back. <laughs> Flashcards are great too. Um, but again, it's, are you instantly just looking at the answers or are you challenging your brain to say, do you remember that? Can you bring that forward for me? And that's the part that we typically miss. So something like um, maybe asking yourself questions about what you've been learning, that would be yes. a, a good way to help with the spaced repetition. Absolutely. There's a, you know, so I, I mentioned the word metacognition. Metacognition, very simple, well, maybe not so simply put, is thinking about what you are thinking about. So it's being aware of your own cognitive processes. Now, those are things that have to be learned as well because they're, you know, it's not easy to stop in the moment and go, but did I just think that, or do I know that, or do I think I know that often as, um, often as learners, we overestimate or underestimate what we know or we don't know. So when you have that conscious awareness of, I actually don't think I know what I'm doing right now because I've stopped to think about it. I've thought in the moment, do I really understand what I just read there? maybe not. Okay, go back. Mm. And that's, that's what's really going to help somebody learn is when you develop those skills to know how to direct your attention so that you can be more self-regulated and more self-aware in your learning, yeah. then you're a step ahead because you can actually catch yourself and you can almost like give yourself feedback saying, Oh, you know what? I thought I knew that. Can I prove it to myself? Okay. Can I retrieve it? Actually, I can't retrieve it. Can I recall what that sentence was? No, I actually, I can't. So go back and do it again. So those are also skills to build upon as learners, but also if you're designing learning as well, you want to integrate these skills into your design so that your learners can also be a little bit more self-regulated. And you can do that through different varieties of retrieval practices and tests and quizzes and whatnot. 
but give them those opportunities to challenge themselves because what's the point of getting through a whole course and then realizing I don't actually remember <laughs> what, or I didn't really understand or grasp that concept from module number three, hmm. but I'm at module number eight. It's too late. So those, those things seem to lead to the, the whole point of learning is to be able to practically apply what you're learning as well. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And, and to a great degree, that is a solidification of, of what you do as well. If you can actually apply what you've been learning, then you can show yourself that you know it. Right. And then it's a matter of, you know, depending on what the skill or the behavior or, you know, what it is that you want um, that you're trying to accomplish, you're going to want to get somebody to, to either monitor that or test you or, or, you know, because we can't necessarily trust our own judgments. Mm -hmm. We've got our own personal biases of what we think we know and what we don't know. So it's always important. That's why feedback is so, you know, so critical sometimes in the learning process because you might think you know it, <laughs> but if somebody else is like, mm, a little bit more work there. So for areas that I want to know really well, one of the things that I do is, uh, and I guess I haven't been completely aware that I've been doing it, but I, I certainly have, is creating speeches, talks about it that I give to my Toastmasters club or somewhere else that I'll actually go and present on an information teach it. And, mm -hmm. uh, and, and that pushes me to, uh, to have a greater level of understanding about yeah. what I've been learning. Because if you're going to talk about it, it's, it's very different to just reading and uh, all this. Yeah. Social learning is incredibly powerful. Um, and for so many different reasons. I mean, when you think about us as individual humans, we all have had so many different life experiences and we've got so many different memories. So, you know, if we're all looking at one thing, we're potentially all interpreting that one thing very differently based on our memories and experiences, which means that, that there's such a plethora of information that us as individuals hold that can then connect it differently for somebody else. Mm -hmm. So it's how do, you know, and those are networks and those are schemas in the brain of like how we interpret our world and how we group things together to make sense of them. But, you know, I, I can't remember if I told you, but there's, there's one thing that I've done in workshops where I'll take these people on, on this magical journey through the brain and they're drawing pictures of and writing down words and interpretations of the same thing. I'm, I'm saying the same thing to hundreds of people. And then we look at these and you walk around the room and not one picture is the same. Mm. And it's fantastic. They all interpret it differently. They all pull upon their memories and experiences. And when you look at a collective consciousness like that, it's absolutely fantastic. So as a designer, again, if there is ways that you can embed social learning or collective memory it's it's phenomenal it's definitely phenomenal one thing that i i have been wanting to speak to you about mm -hmm. is the area of accelerated learning mm -hmm. because again as i mentioned that there are some places where there's a lot of bullshit around and then there are some yeah. that, uh, that there's uh, a lot of good stuff around uh, in terms of being able to speed up our learning process what in your opinion is is real and works and what's kind of bullshit and doesn't really work. I think, you know, if you, if you sort of summarize all of the little things that we've been talking about thus far, I mean, those are the things that really work. It's, it's being intentional and strategizing. It's using space, to, uh, using methodologies like space repetition and interleaving. Um, it's knowing the limitations of your own brain and, and how to operate and work with that a little bit more, you know, anybody who is, you know, and again, Hey, if you've got the time to dedicate, to learn to juggle day in and day out, you're probably going to learn it a lot faster than I am. <laughs> um, but it's, it's that really, you know, it, it's really that timing factor of it. How much time do you have to dedicate it to? And then are you utilizing the proper methodologies in order to help that process? You know? Sure. Um, so that's the, you know, there is for me, it's, and I think that's where, uh, especially in an organizational world, where we have to we have to level set the expectations on how fast somebody can learn versus how fast they can transfer to produce something it's been very skewed for a very long time and you know who suffers the humans suffer because i can't perform because i didn't learn this or my sales metrics are down because of this or my compliance numbers are off because you know i didn't we didn't pass our compliance test mm -hmm. but but you went to that eight hour day of training oh but you went to that workshop but you did that e-learning it doesn't work like that, you know? So we've got to be a little bit more um, sensitive to, to the human process 
and you know more aware of that process so that we can really level set expectations on what we can and cannot do and what times we can. So as far as accelerated learning goes, yeah, if you've got all the time in the world to dedicate to that one thing, you're going to do a lot, lot more, a lot faster than most. But um, if you're like everybody else who has a job or has a family or has other, you know, life commitments, things are going on. Um, you just have to be a little bit more intentional about the time that you spend and, and be really strategic about it as well. I, I got very interested in accelerated learning as an area for, for a while and I even uh, did a, a workshop, an online workshop about it that I run for a while as well. And um, there were things like, I, I, I've done several speed week reading workshops myself mm -hmm. uh, as an attendee and and I really am feeling, I may end up increasing my reading speed, but I always find it comes at the cost of comprehension for me. Yes. Uh, yes. Would, would you say that's gem, generally true for, for these things? I haven't done extensive research on this, but my, actually I was asked um, to come in and, and audit uh, a speed reading course. And I did. And um, then I did some research on it. And it turns out, just to your point, um, speed reading isn't really a thing. <laughs> you can get through something a lot faster, but the retention and the comprehension rate is a lot lower. So um, yeah, I, from, from the research and from what I understand thus far, uh, it's not really a thing. I mean, it's a thing as, as far as like, yeah, I can like scan something really quickly and get through a book faster. But if that's your only objective, then yes, congratulations, you can speed read if you Yeah, the only thing I've ever found it useful for is in like constructing speeches or finding bits of information for content I already know a bit as well, not for some reading something just off the bat, but to speed read and find stuff that you want to utilize. Or, right, or, right. Um, or getting specific chunks of information, like if you want to create a set of flashcards or uh, some prepared information for you to review. That for me has been the only place I found it useful. I'm I'm open to people who maybe I was saying no, it works, and I use it, and I would I remember it all. If mm. that, I'd love to hear from. Them. <laughs> I'd, I'd yeah, some people it does. Some people it does, but I mean, even to that too, and like for for the purposes of what you're using, what you're using it for, it seems like well, you're already before you even open that book or open that website, whatever it is, you're already priming your brain to say we're looking out for this. Yeah. So just focus on that. Look for those keywords, look for that, right? So you're not reading through everything, in which case you're being, again, more strategic and intentional about where you're directing your focus and attention to. Well, one of the things that uh, occurs to me that where there is a, perhaps a, a problem with online learning, uh, yeah. because you were saying how important social learning is, and I see this as well, um, when you learn with a group, like in a workshop or even even in an online group, you learn from the things that other people get that you may not mm. directly see, and they'll learn from those bits for you. Whereas with very sort of self-contained, self-directed online learning, it's often just you and the computer. Mm -hmm. And yeah. so there's an perhaps an important bit that's missing there. Is is there any way around that, or any compensations that can that can come in and help? Yeah, I mean, depending on, on who or what you're designing for, you can design it in, you can build communities within, within the learning, you can, you know, whether or not you can utilize, whether it's social media, it's Facebook pages, or Twitter groups, or whatever, whatever that is, you can design that intentionally in, um, maybe you want to go, maybe you want to do a live session every one or two weeks if you have the luxury you know it depends on how large scale you're going and how many people it is that you're trying you're trying to reach but you can do that maybe as part of your design you want to encourage people to go find those you know you know like your book club if you will um, and create that community but at the end of the day if you're alone with your computer and you're just watching some videos it's really going to be up to you and that comes back to the metacognition to self-regulate yeah. and to self-test and, you know, to go out and seek people who, who can validate your knowledge. So, you know, I'm, me, myself, dealing with the sciences, I don't trust myself at all when it comes to these things. You know, I'm not going to leave it into my own hands. I'm going to reach out to, you know, to the, to the friends who are behavioral scientists or the neuroscientists or whatever to say, do I have this right? Because I'm translating their, I'm translating their work. I'm translating science, right? And I don't have an extensive, I didn't do a PhD. And I, I don't have the extensive knowledge that they do. So I might do an online course, but I'm going to find somebody who's done this for a lot longer than I have to make sure that what I think I know, I actually do know. Which is a, a much better attitude than people thinking they know enough about a subject after watching a couple of YouTube videos, for sure. <laughs> 
<laughs> if that were the case, then I'd be able to juggle right now. <laughs> yeah, we, we, we all suffer with uh, the, the Dunning-Kruger effect and, and even even people who are aware of it and, and have uh, awareness that they may not always know as much, we, we still, uh, we're still subject to it to thinking yeah we know more than we than we really do or that we're better at something than we really are there's a you know classical psychological um experiments where and i think i think all of us at some point you know and, and ones have probably participated in these is if you show somebody a jar of gumballs or pennies or whatever it is and you ask the person like take a good guess what do you think is in there not you know they're going to be usually significantly off. But when you collectively get a group of people to do it, right. every time they're closer to the target. So that collective, you know, that collective sort of consciousness and the collective sort of, you know, it really does make a difference in the way that we understand, um, you know, what we're thinking about and what we're looking at. But it's that networking aspect of it. I'm sure you've probably had an experience of saying that I have when you're like, I've never thought about it that way. Right. Like, oh, I'm like, and then all of a sudden it just makes sense. Yeah. It's like, oh, I just never thought about it that way. Hmm. Yeah. Sometimes you just need to hear something put in the right way by the right person at the right time and, and it clicks. Uh, and you, Absolutely. You, you, yeah. I, I think of, I can actually think of a very specific thing that there was something that I, I, I used to work at a lot of live trainings, live weekend events, and I would often hear the same thing again about. Um, having the having the right mindset. Uh, this uh, guy I worked with Har Harvecker. He says um, he didn't become a millionaire. Uh, uh, didn't become a millionaire until he made the decision to become a millionaire. Mm. Uh, and I just thought, oh well, you just have to make that decision. And then one time it hit me that it just just made sense all of a sudden. And it was from him as well. It was from hearing him say it that just have, maybe after just having heard it so many times, I suddenly got. It's not just the decision it's like the decision that this is who i am now this is who yeah. I'm, yeah. this is who i've decided that i'm going to be so i need to be that person now not just i'm going to get that at some point in the future and, yeah. and so yeah it definitely that 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 makes a uh, real sense for me that, that learning doesn't always happen at, at the first introduction of, uh, of the no no not at all i mean i mean if, when i look at my own experiences and and just you know it was almost embarrassing to be quite honest like you know to have uh you know to be into in my career like I started off a, um, as a teacher in academics overseas and then have this like long you know almost 14 years of uh, organizational learning and teaching you know thousands of people at this point designing thousands of lessons and then neuroscience comes into my world and go oh man, how did I never think about the brain? <laughs> like, how did I miss that for all this time? And, I, and it was just that moment. It was that like, how did I not know this? How did I not? Know? Okay, well, we but need to know everything. <laughs> but there is uh, a, a good level of shame attached to mm. ignorance, right? Mm. Uh, and, yeah. and, and yet we're all ignorant of a great Something. many things. We don't, yeah. we don't always know exactly what we're ignorant of. And and so I, I hope at some point as a society, we might get to a point where we can move past having this shame for not knowing things. I, I've worked very hard on myself and getting to a point in my life where I'm okay sometimes with saying, I don't know. Yeah. Because I don't need to have the answers to everything. No. Um, but yeah, there are still, I still encounter this online in sometimes discussion forums and things. I try not to do too much on the social media interaction, but on, on more discussion forums where some people who do have expert knowledge um, treat that as if, well, doesn't everybody know this? Yeah, <laughs> are, yeah. Are you a bit yeah. stupid that you don't know this? Well, not necessarily. So it's, it's interesting. Like I was having a conversation the other day and, you know, in, in the work that I do, you know, it's, for me, what I learned um, very quickly, not just about learning, but especially about science. Um, and again, we're, we're looking at the most complex thing on the planet, our brains. And I was very quickly humbled by it, incredibly humbled by the science and by the process and by the extreme amounts of work that have to go in to just learning the, the smallest, smallest piece of information about us. And then you've got the other side. So you can either be humbled by it or you can have a mass ego about it and say, Yes, well, now that I have done these courses and spoken to these doctors, I will tell you everything there is to know about the brain. And I'm like, no, nah, no. <laughs> so you're either, you know, you, you can either be humble with yourself and vulnerable. We, we hear that word a lot. Um, and, you know, I, one of the, 
the talks, um, I, I, I think, you know, I do a lot of speaking and I just decided, you know, if, if people want to see what the true learning journey for me looked like, I'm going to show you. And there's pictures up. And I mean, we're talking like massive movie sized screens and there's a massive picture of me crying, <laughs> just absolutely in tears. And my hair is a mess. And like, there's a stain on my shirt. And I'm like, ah, this is, that was learning. It was this like crazy, like challenging, but it was, I'm going to show you how it really is because I'm going to also tell you, I'm not a neuroscientist. I'm a translator. I do have my credentials in neuro, but I don't know it all. I don't want to, I, I don't want to know it all um, because very fortunately we have billions of people on this planet uh, who can fill in those gaps for us. Yeah. So you don't need to set yourself up as the ultimate authority. Um, but you can set yourself up with uh, expertise to say, I can talk about this, um, but I don't have to have all the answers to be able to do that. No, that's basically stunting your learning right there and then, you know, when yeah. you lose your curiosity and you think that you know it all, well, then tomorrow's going to feel and, and look a lot like today. I'm a, I'm a very committed lifelong learner. And I think it wasn't always so. I, say I went for quite a long period after leaving university <laughs> to uh, probably my 30s, where I didn't spend very much time learning if I didn't have to do it for work yeah. or something like that. Uh, but then when I got into personal development, and I started investing money in my learning. And again, mm -hmm. some of it was great, some of it was dubious. <laughs> Crap. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, like, I missed a lot of money in, in learning NLP, and like some of it, again, some of it's great, some of it's not, um, and, and many other areas. But now my, my learning is very self directed, and you know, I choose very specific p things that I want to learn. I, um, I, when I started getting more into public speaking, I started trying to learn as much as possible about public speaking um, with stuff I'm doing on podcasting. Uh, I'm trying to learn as much as I can about podcasting. You know, yeah, I, I really yeah. like to, I don't need to become an expert, but I like to at least get a good general level of knowledge where I can say I'm comfortable with what I know in this area. Yeah. And, and I know some stuff rather than just like, well, I'm doing it, but I don't have a clue what I'm doing. Um, but in terms of self-directed learning, which, which can be challenging, do you have mm -hmm. any recommendations for people to keep themselves excited and motivated with their own learning? You know, everybody is going to be motivated by something different. And, you know, for, and I, I can only share from my own personal experiences, right, is, you know, okay, so I learned about the brain, or I, I, I sort of had that revelation, like, oh, my gosh, the brain, that's the thing doing the learning, I should probably know something about that. And I was highly motivated, because, you know, again, I misled myself, oh, this is gonna be easy, I'm just gonna go and study and find, you know, and it wasn't, <laughs> it wasn't, but what kept me going was understanding why I wanted to do this so badly and how it was going to change. Um, you know, when I started that journey, it was very much related to work. And I was like, I need to learn everything that I can so I can bring this back into learning and, and learn how to be a better designer. And it was really, really, really motivating me to do so. The further I got into my studies, I then realized, oh, wow, I am learning a lot about me. I'm learning a lot about me as a human. Um, at the time, um, I had a 98-year-old a grandmother who I uh, was, you know, declining, obviously. And then my motivation got turned towards her. She had dementia. I said, there's gotta be something, you know, if I study a little bit more, if I learn a little bit more about this, I might be able to connect with this gorgeous woman who I'm losing, you know, piece by piece. But, and it, and it was motivating for me to do that. And, you know, the last few months of her life, I was able to connect with her and because of what I, so my motivation was very high yeah. because of that. So I think, it's always going back to if you're learning just because you're curious about something, then you're already going to do it. It's like, you're going to be motivated to do it. You're going to chase that curiosity. When I find that you're learning to, to change something that you're doing functionally or practically, that's when you've got to kind of go back to yourself and be like, how is this really going to affect X or Y? Um, for me, if what helped me and I, I would, you know, I, I recommend anybody give it a go, just treat it like an experiment. Make yourself your own beautiful scientific experiment, you know, hypothesize what, why, you know, what is it that I think I'm going to learn and why am I learning it? But what am I going to do with it afterwards? What is that end result going to look like? And be okay to fail. Like, just be okay to fail. One of, um, you know, when I was saying, you know, how humbled I am by science, I, I'll never forget this conversation with, a, with one of the, the scientists at a teaching hospital here in Toronto. And 
I said, you know, I'm, I really feel like I've been humbled by everything. I said, I'll read your papers, but it takes me like two or three days to read one paper because I need to, I, I can't, I need to uncode it and, and learn and, and, and that. And he's like, now imagine me and my colleagues will spend years, years doing the same research. And maybe at the end of three years, we realize there was nothing there for us to learn and we have to start all over again. And I just like, at that moment, I was like, oh my gosh, okay. That's just it is no, you know, I, we're all motivated by something that's inside of us. Yeah. You know, I, I love what you're saying about um, that you were learning specifically to, to connect with your, your grandmother. Yeah. And, and uh, sometimes hear things about learning as a tool to, uh, at least slow down or combat cognitive decline. Yes. Is there solid evidence or solid research for that? There is, and um, I don't, I, I mean, it's nothing that I dive into that much myself. Um, for the the hospital that, that I affiliate with uh, in Toronto, it's called the Rotman Research Center, and they specifically focus on um, learning memory, Alzheimer's, and dementia. And um, it's, yeah, they're, they're finding out new things every single day. We know that, I mean, whether you like it or not, everyone, you're learning every day. <laughs> like your brain's just doing it. It's what it's, 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 it's job is yeah. to continually, you know, look around and learn to keep you safe and keep you alive. There is significant amounts of research happening right now to, to, you know, look at these things. Um, I know it just in passing, probably in, uh, when I was doing some work or whatnot, I probably came across some articles on new, new, um, new techniques for Alzheimer's. But yeah, I mean, I think the best thing that we can do is, keep your brain stimulated, keep challenging it, you know, like anything else, like a muscle, if, if you just don't do anything, it just kind of stays the same and yeah. stays stagnant. So, you know, I always, when I, when I looked at my grandmother, you know, she was wheelchair bound for, for several years when, you know, before she passed. And, and I always thought, you know, what scared, I don't know what scares me more even to this day is knowing as much as I do now is, if my brain is stronger when I get older, my, my body's still going to deteriorate, <laughs> like, which is worse. <laughs> so, but uh, now I'd say, you know, it's really, there's, this is what keeps us alive. Yeah. You know, this is what makes us us. This is the, allows me to speak with you, to look at you, to, to process everything that's going around. And um, for the most part, I'd say myself included, we, we take it immensely for granted, mm. immensely for granted. So it's very complex and it's very, 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 you know, intricate what's going on in there. But even if you can learn just something small, just a little something like these conversations that you and I are having, um, it really does make a really big significant difference to, to understand you as you, but to also look at other people around you a lot differently. Yeah. I mean, interestingly, the anti-aging or aging <laughs> science is, is huge and, and there's a lot of money going into combating that and, and from what I've read uh, over recent months a lot of that is focused more on slowing aging something that they believe is more easy to do than trying to reverse or, or stop it altogether. right uh, so that one of the biggest things that's being focused on now is slowing that down um but they're they're, they're making lots of discoveries all the time and lots of developments so who yes. knows how soon we'll see them and probably they'll go to the people who can afford it first before it rolls down to uh, to the rest of us mere mortals but uh, in terms of neuroscience, what mm. do you at least think the future holds in terms oh, of wow. learning and uh, where we're going? It's so phenomenal. You know, every time I think that, you know, the coolest thing has come out, something even cooler comes out. And I'm just like, wow, <laughs> like, how, how did you do that? Um, you know, one of the, one of the latest things that um, I saw that really, really impressed me was a, uh, a university, I think it's called Ola or Ola um, in Finland. And they've got, I believe, the first dual MRI. So typically only one person can go into the MRI at a time. They've got a dual MRI. So now that they can actually look at the interactions happening in the brains of two people at the same time. So, um, you know, they've done, they're doing a current study with couples. They've got 10 couples. They're putting them into the machines together. They're asking them to, to do things just like, you know, touch each other's faces or and eventually that is going to, that research is going to expand and expand um, to look at things like, how do we problem solve with one another? Uh, and what does the communication look like and the executive functions? So that, that is one side of it. Then you've got 
you know, all of the phenomenal, there, there's so much in the field of um, neuroplasticity mm. and, and really understanding how the brain rewires itself to allow people who have never seen before to see. And that, you know, I've seen, I've seen it. I've seen the talks, I've seen the research. It blows me away every time. Um, you've, yeah. you've got electrostimulations for people with Parkinson's. I got it's, very excited when I read, is it Albert Deutsch? Uh, his book, mm -hmm. The Brain That Changes Itself. Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, that was, Norman, Norman Deutsch, yeah, he's amazing. Norman, Norman, yeah. There's, um, you know, and I, you know, books like that are just absolutely phenomenal. There's another uh, gentleman, V.S. Ramachandran, whose work I just got obsessed with because I just couldn't believe the, the magnificence of our brains. Um, and his topic was more on what they call phantom limbs. Um, and when there's, when, you know, you've lost a leg or an arm, but you still believe it to be there and you can, and right. that people perceive and feel the pain. And the experiments that he did with this to sort of like rewire um, and re-engineer to, to sort of put things back in place. I was like, this, this is just phenomenal. So the, right now there's, there's, a, there's a lot of scientists right now who are trying to answer the question of what's consciousness. Yes. You know, um, and that, that itself is a really, really interesting research. Um, for me, I'm just always going to be fascinated with, um, with memory and how that is, you know, all the magical places in, in which that is stored and, and how it happens and how it declines and, and anything that has to do with, with that is really sort of what I'm, I'm very curious about. But like I said, it's, um, for me, it's a rabbit hole. It is a, it is a rabbit hole of wonderful information. Um, and I only see that we're going to learn so much more about ourselves um, in the future that will really be able to effectively change, you know, things that that we've never been able to change before in the past yeah. we can only we can only speculate i guess but w would you say that neuroscience then in, as, a, as an area is still in uh, in the early stages yeah yeah absolutely i mean neuroscience is still one of the the more infant sciences as, and, and um you know i say the interest in the brain i mean that goes back thousands of years you know it's just the methodologies of being able to study it were um a little disturbing back then <laughs> a lot had to do with like you know physically drilling holes into people's heads and yeah. you know whoops um but yeah i'd say the there's so many endless possibilities in this field and um, I can't, I, I'm just, I'm just so privileged that I get to even, you know, peek into it and, and speak to the people that I speak to and just be completely amazed and wowed at, at how this all, how this all, this three pounds of just, you know, jello <laughs> come together to, mm -hmm. to make us us. Other than speaking and talking like we are now about, about this yeah. subject, where are you applying your, your work and your knowledge? What kind of areas uh, and people are you working with there? So, uh, you know, for, for quite some time, I was doing a lot of uh, organizational design. So anything that had to do with, um, you know, in, enhancing employee experiences when it comes to what they needed to learn, I was brought in to basically redevelop and redesign. So I did a lot of that. Um, currently, uh, it kind of sort of fits into to what we're, we're talking about um, is, yes, learning is the overarching topic here, but as a translator, uh, I found it was very important for me to start sharing this with a lot more people, not just in the context of learning, but in, in the sort of the context of understanding us as humans better. So um, spoiler alert, uh, I am developing, there's, there's a course that, courses, I just realized it wasn't just one. <laughs> so there are courses that, that are in the works that will be released hopefully by the end of September. Um, and those will be online, they will be public, um, they will be scientifically designed as well. So everything that we've just spoken about, um, you know, the repetition, the interleaving, the community, the social, it is all going to be in there. Um, so those will get released sometime then. And uh, for the most part, I get hired because people want to just leverage the expertise of the brain and they want to know more, whether that be for learning design or, you know, for everyday life design. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's been honestly, it's so fascinating to hear what you do. And I even saying that you're not like uh, the, the total authority on this, you, you just work yeah. in this area, you know, not about it mm -hmm. and you're helping other people to understand it more. And in yeah. terms of getting up on a public stage and speaking about this, is that something you had done before? Or? A lot. Yeah, a lot. Um, so, uh, you know, we're, we're in a, we're in a time of history right now where that's no, no longer feasible, but um, yeah, there's still, I do a lot of podcasts. I do a lot of speaking engagements and um, I'm always, I think 
anybody who's curious enough to reach out to me to say, hey, would you mind coming and talking to us about this? I'd be, absolutely, absolutely. So um, the speaking engagements will, will definitely live on. I, I should probably, you know, make a list of all the podcasts I've been on and, and put, those, put those out there as well. Um, yeah, so I've got to get out of my own learning and research holes to, to put this all out there, but yes. They're, they're a great resource for you. I mean, I was listening to one of the podcasts uh, so the 30 before we started recording that, that you did uh, and uh, with the behaviorist, your, your friend. Yes. And, uh, yes. and I was loving it. I was fascinated and thinking, oh, I try not to make the questions too similar. I'll try. But, but nonetheless, I wasn't so much thinking about because I just got engrossed in the information and, and found it such a, such a fascinating area and uh, I love listening to it. I think it's super interesting. Uh, I don't plan to move into working in it myself, but I, but I definitely think there's a lot of application there that mm -hmm. I can utilize mm -hmm. and bring into what I do, especially with um, even things like, uh, like I'm working on a book, writing a book and creating online programs is all stuff that, that can really get a lot of value and benefit from there's the people like you so do. There's so much, so much practical application. Um, and it's really, you know, if I had a magic wand and I could just like, you know, teach the world, teach everybody how to, to learn again um, and in a different way, in a way that is challenging, but makes you feel exceptionally wonderful, then, you know, I would do it. But, you know, right now we can only put out what we can put out. Um, those who know me uh, know, and you'll see like it's tattooed on my arm is the word YAR and YAR is, stands for you are really ready. It's you are really ready. And that to me is that moment where you're like, got it let's do this. I can tell, I can share this. I'm confident. I know that I have learned. Um, so for me, spreading the ideology of YAR, that's, that's what, what, what makes all of the hard work and, and the research and the crying and the, and, and the frustration, but the victory, it makes it so sweet. So YAR to everyone. <laughs> Absolutely. And uh, I, I always like to I uh, ask my guests for a book mm. recommendation and you know, I'm happy if it's my guest's own book or if there's a book that uh, I think in this case, maybe a book that may be a good place for people to go to, to get a bit more, if they're interested in the neuroscience and the learning, what would be a book that you would recommend as a good place to further their education? Ooh, um, I am actually, uh, so I'm currently rereading uh, Daniel Connerman's Thinking Fast and Slow. Oh, I love that book. Yeah, um, but it's it's a little bit of a heavy read at times, mm. uh, and that's why I'm going again. I'm relearning. I'm going back to to really dive into it. Um, I like that book only because it it gives you a like a good base of you know the systems, and I think that's a great place to start. Is just understanding those couple of systems. Um, if you are a, a designer of learning and you want to learn how to do, you know, sort of start integrating more of these things. You've got, um, you know, Julie Dirksen who wrote a wonderful book. You've got Margie Meacham who I, I think she's phenomenal. There's so many, there's so many wonderful people who I could cite at this point. Um, so it, it's just a matter of, you know, my biggest advice for everyone is just, you know, really be uh, intentional and, make sure that you're not falling into the myth of, you know, the marketing. So look at who it is that's, you know, make sure that you've got a credible resource because I can tell you from, on behalf of the scientists and of the people who spend their lives, you know, trying to get it, get us all this information and we owe it to them to, you to, know, to, to be credible and, and to try to maintain ethics and, and value in the work that they've provided for us. Hopefully, and uh, far, far too many people undervalue that or get more yeah. attracted to uh, a flashy, styling, yeah. egocentric message than mm -hmm. to the maybe not so, uh, not always so sexy looking and flashy, but the real knowledge, the stuff that actually works and, and is, it has substance to it. And, yeah. and often people can't see past the these sort of surface things, but to take a look behind the behind the screen to yeah. to see what's really going on with the Wizard of Oz. <laughs> so. Yeah, yeah, and it's something that I, you know, something that I started to do myself. Um, during during this time that we've been online, I'll do presentations and I'll ask people at the end of it. I said, "Do you want me to? Do you want me to show you how I designed this? Do you want? I'll, I, you know, there's there's when you're learning, there's you don't hoard learning." You don't hoard your secrets, you know, and um, the amount of people who said we'd actually, you know, spend an extra 20 minutes to a half an hour online with me and I'll take them through my whole presentation. And I'll be like, I will show you how science was used to design this. 
So we, we might have to record another episode and do that. <laughs> I'd love to. I'd love to. Yeah. Yeah. I'd love to. I love doing that. One, I know one thing that I'd really love to get with you at some point, but not, not today is, is like you, you posted something recently about uh, taxonomy and learning and, uh, and some stuff that was advancing or um, taking a look at uh, what's replacing things like Bloom's taxonomy and, and things like that. And, and that, that was kind of, that was an interesting area for me and just understanding the level levels of learning that we go through and, uh, and how we utilize our knowledge and what actually, um, what is actually scientific or not scientific about that. That's a, that was a bit of a rabbit hole in itself. And, uh, uh, but it could be an interesting area to come back to in the future. But I don't want to hog too much of your time. You shared so, <laughs> so much great information with today. And I really loved this conversation. Me and too. I don't even need to ask you for any closing thoughts because I think you've already shared those really. <laughs> I will ask you how people can come and find out more about you. Um, I, I'm taking a little social media break, but I am usually quite active on LinkedIn and that's where you can find, um, articles I've written. Um, I'd actually recommend to anybody who, who does have a, a parent, a grandparent or someone who has gone through, um, or is going through dementia, Alzheimer's. Um, I did a tribute article to my grandmother last year when she passed. So, um, you know, I, I would love for, for people to sort of take some comfort or solace in that, um, learningpirate.com is the website where you can see what this brain has created and what's going out there. Uh, I should be on Twitter more than I am, <laughs> but quite honestly, you can connect with me on LinkedIn. There, I, for right now, there's only one learning pirate on LinkedIn and it's me. So. <laughs> It's, it's a good place to connect with you and I, I'm very glad we got to connect there and to have yes. a conversation today. I really enjoyed it and I certainly hope to come and connect with you and, and maybe record another episode with you in the future. But Anytime, uh, anytime. It has been an absolute pleasure. Lauren Wolven, thank you so much. Yar, thank you. <laughs> Thanks for tuning in. I hope you've enjoyed the show. Please make sure to like and subscribe. Don't miss future episodes like next week when I will be speaking to a lady who escaped from a cult and is now healing herself and her life through the practice of meditation. This is the incredible Brooke Walker on next week's show. Don't miss her and other amazing guests who are coming up soon. If you have some feedback for us, if you're interested in being a guest from the show or finding out more about us, please Please contact me john at presentinfluence.com or check out the presentinfluence.com website or find me on social media i'd love to hear from you see you next time